Hey, congratulations, Chris, on the book Under a Rock. And I'll tell you what, until I got my hands on this book, I, I really didn't know how much a rolling stone gathers no moss. You don't stop. Yeah, I had a weird existence overall. <laughs> I, there was a guy, one of the English newspapers, the, in the review, the guy wrote, you know, this is odd that this person life seems to gotten more normal after he joined a rock band <laughs> because the early stuff is kind of, kind of crazy. Is that because of formatics and, and, and basically dis uh, you know, disciplines and things, because I mean, you, you knew that you had to be on a plan and you had to stick to it. Yeah. Say the first part again, you broke up a little because of the disciplines and things with music. And you know, you know how those road managers, you've got to be on that stage at a certain time. Do you think that's part of the focus of, of, of keeping your story fresh and moving forward? Well, you mean being professional is what I would call it. Yeah, kind of. Uh, it's hard to say. I, my, you know, my wife helps me out. I don't know if I could would. I don't know if she'd want to be called a road manager. <laughs> but, but she's uh, she's a great help in my life. To write this book. Under a Rock, comparing it to the stories of the music journalists that you've met along the way, how did you keep it into the one-on-one -on -one form? Because I really feel like that you've invited us over to your house to share the story. Yeah, no, I mean, it was. I started when we were doing the COVID deal and was just sitting around and people were encouraging me to do it. It seemed like the right time. I've always thought, and this, this is how kind of a weird or a freaky guy I am, Heart of Glass is my jukebox hero. That was the song that I always went to when it came to the jukebox. And and it's so when Foreigner came out with their song, I'm going, oh, hell no. It's Heart of Glass. That's the jukebox hero. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not a big music file. I just know stuff that comes in front of my face. Like Clem, our drummer, knows everybody in every band that ever existed. <laughs> But uh, so I can't say as I, which foreigner song are we discussing? Yeah. So then when, when you are credited for being the architect of Blondie, I took my drafting classes and we were always taught you have to ask the question, why? Did you find yourself in that same position, building this band and keeping this band growing forward? It was a little more chaotic than that. But yeah, it was, uh, you know, Debbie and me being together. I, I, as I mentioned in the book, I feel like a band should always be a kind of monarchical, monarchic di dictatorship, mm -hmm. but also have aspects of dem dem democracy going on. It's, it's hard to say. You, you kind of need somebody calling the shots a little bit. See, I, I have to have that. I've got to have somebody giving me a map. And I think that's the reason why I'm best friends with Google Calendar, because what's on that map, I've got, I've got to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah. 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 I'm kind of okay with that. Yeah. You didn't have the digital social media that we have today. That had to have been a grand challenge for Blondie. Well, you all know, everything took so long to get out into the world. Just even, I mean, the radio was fast, but there was no national music press in America the way there was in the UK. That's why stuff went crazy in the UK. They had the weekly newspapers. It was different than in America. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always thought of the band as being a great masterpiece of music in the way that you utilized every medium. You you were on the radio. You were on MTV. You were in the magazines. And you everywhere we looked, you were. And I just thought, I've always been inspired by that. Well, MTV never really put us in heavy rotation wow. because they really want, they wanted to they wanted to say, oh, you know, we invented Madonna and we invented Billy Idol and all those bands that were coming up. Wow. That that, that shocks me because, I mean, it, it, you were such an intricate part of, of me getting into music because I always felt like that, you know, we could take chances with music. Yeah, no, we tried everything that we could to put the stuff out in the world. So we were doing videos really early on. The first videos were way before MTV. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, we, and even when being with Dick Clark, I mean, what was that like? Yeah, Dick Clark, yeah. All of that kind of stuff. Uh, I think, I guess we were, I don't know if we were on Solid Gold. Uh, yeah, we, we just were doing it all the time. 
Was it a struggle along the way that when Deborah Harry, your wife, when she became the the main image of the band, everybody would call her Blondie? And it's it's almost like, no, her name is Debbie. The group is called Blondie. Radio people, to me, always failed the band. It was, it was like, give Chris some love, too. Yeah, but, you know, Debbie was so gorgeous and yes. exceptional. It was, it made, I, I never, it never bothered me. Some of the, you know, it made for a little bit of tension in the band, you know. Take some shots. Okay. When when you guys brought the the music together, what what was the process? I mean, did everybody sit around and 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 grow it together, or was it something that started with you? A little bit of both. I mean, I would get the basics of songs, and then they would be you know put through this process of every hands on. A lot of everybody had some part in it, and especially with Mike Chapman, there you know he was you know like the George Martin of Blondie, and it was just. It was great, but everybody added stuff. Certainly, all the band members. Did it did it injure you at all when people would slip you into the punk rock era? And I thought, wow, I, punk rock. I, I thought maybe maybe pop and and rock, but not punk rock. Or, or did you see yourself as a punk band? You no, know, I. You know, we had elements of punk. We frequently would describe ourselves as being pop rock, but the punk sensibilities are there. You know, some of the style stuff and aggressive sound. And the do-it-yourself things are punk, but I I think like the first two Rolling Stones albums are completely punk. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll never forget my program director when the Titus High came in. He thought it was going to change the face of AM radio because we needed something and we needed a big push. And he felt that that was the song that was going to keep people on AM and a little bit more away from FM. Nice. Yeah, that was the. I really that's the only song I knew was going to be a hit. Before we, you know, even before we recorded it, because I it was a cover of that old version from nineteen, yeah, the Paragons from nineteen sixty seven, and the original is brilliant, and I I, I was just positive it was going to be a hit for us. Oh yeah, because you could sing along with it, and and you know, and radio plays by one rule. If I can't get to the hook of the song in twenty five seconds, it's going into the can. But you guys, oh my God, you mastered that format. Yeah, no, I mean, I was so knocked out when, you know, they used it in Better Call Saul, when he, Saul is singing Tide is High when he's driving along. I don't know if you remember that moment, but for us to get into the Breaking Bad universe was amazing. When when you do a song like One Way or Another, because that was a change in, in, in that you now, now you had that rock edge to it, and now I could crank it up at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on my way home. Yeah, we I always liked the aggressive stuff, you know, we were... Huge Ramones fans from day one. Uh, yeah. When putting the book together, how did you lay out the book? Did did chronologically, or was that was that the the idea? Did the editor step in and say, "Chris, we need to do it this way so that they can jump from chapter to chapter and not go from chapter one to chapter nine to chapter six? No, it just moves along in the timeline. Yeah, pretty much. I did a bunch of research as I was doing it i had to check things facts and places and dates but uh it, it's not a tremendous amount of editing but we you know i had some suggestions but that was after i had already written it and done a bunch of passes they always say when someone authors a book when it's given to the fans or those that are going to read it you have to relinquish control are you going through a mourning period or anything like that or are you just glad it's off your chest oh. No, it's good. I'm really looking forward to more people interacting with it. And I'd like, you know, I'd, I'd like to answer some more specific questions about some of the weird stuff in it. Yeah. See, and that, that's what's great about the book is that you're transparent about those weird things because, you know, we all assume that we know a band. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, there's a lot of buildup about my life personally before the band. I was at a lot of places in the culture that are significant, you know, moments in music history. Yeah. Now, when, when you talk about the moments, I mean, that's one of those things that's tucked away in a cavern somewhere inside your heart to uncover them. Did it, did it take private writing times or was it, did it come into a conversation? Because there are many times that I'll be talking with my wife and I'll go, Oh my God, I got to write about that subject. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes something would get triggered 
and I would remember some new event or a fact. And the photography, you know, I was always taking pictures, so those help trigger memories too. Yeah. Ooh, the photographers always being around, especially the paparazzi, because we wanted to see the band. We wanted to see new original shots. Did it ever get old? I mean, look at the, the world today with all these reality shows where the cameras are constantly around. No, I, yeah, and it was different. You know, the social media stuff has changed everybody's interface with reality. I mean, it would have been nice to have a little camera in my pocket the way I do now when I'm just going to concerts and stuff because there's a lot of stuff I wish I had shot that I just didn't want to deal with bringing a camera along. Yeah. Did it, Did you? were you inspired to write any new music while releasing this story? Because I mean, I, I'm always oh, charged up when when I when I write. It's like, oh my god, this 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 is a start of a new song. We have a record in the can now that's just that'll probably be out this year that we worked on. I was wondering. For, yeah, so that's just getting mixed and stuff now. I, I'm not even sure of a release date yet. And, and d does that also spell out a tour? Because with this book, you know, you know, every bookstore is going to want to see you first of all. Then we're going to let you go be the rock star on the stage. Yeah, maybe. No, well, I haven't been touring with the band because of my health stuff. My stamina is just not what it used to. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just doing the recording stuff. But maybe I'll, yeah, I'm will i going to do a couple of things for the book. But don't you love that feeling of being in the studio where you can mastermind the sound? And then this way, then when, when it does go out, it you know it's going to be different because we know how music evolves. But there's just something about being in that studio where you're in control. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for the last 20 years, I've been doing computer music and working up demos with on a computer anyway. But yeah, I love I, I like tweaking stuff endlessly. I, I remember being in there using tape and making sure that those heads were clean. And I mean, to me, those were the yeah. tough days of recording things. Yeah, no, I used to I used to have my own 24 track set up. Um, but it's all become I, you know, computer at this point. One of the pivotal times in music history, and, and you still hear jocks talking about it today, is when you guys included rap in the song Rapture. That was that was a chance. And, and, and for so many people, that was the first time they'd ever heard of rap music. It was just really exciting seeing that stuff full on for the first time and seeing all those kids going at it. And it was it was moving at the same time as the downtown seed, but it just hadn't connected. And we were lucky to hook up with Freddie and he, you know, he took us to see some events. Was it challenging to get, was it challenging to get radio stations to play the length of the song? Because we've all heard those stories of even Bohemian Rhapsody and things. Be, oh, it's too long. It's too long. Radio has to have 345. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't remember that so much. I remember all the, all the, record company guys telling me rap was just a fad and it was going to go away. So that, that what stands out. And yet it's a rap that when you hear it today, it still feels and sounds as fresh as all can be. What, I mean, I, I, to, to put it together, did you feel that moment as it was happening? So somewhat, you know, it was, you know, the whole thing was exciting. And again, working with Chapman was fantastic. You know, I, I, can't ever thank him enough for what he contributed. What what have you learned along the way? Because you're always a student, because you're always aware of everything that's around you, especially what, like you were talking about, the roots of your own life are in this book right now. Did you learn anything from the adult that you are now, from from the younger person that you were when the book starts? Yeah, I mean, I I, I can't believe all the stupid stuff I said in the <laughs> media. You know, I see the old I see the old interviews. And I'm continually like, oh, my God, it's cringy, some of the things I said. So like that. But, you know, and, I, you know, I went through, I dealt with addiction for yeah. a large part of my life, too. So I'm writing about that, too. Yeah, but when you talk about addiction, though, it, to me, the root of all addiction is that creativity is the addiction. Yeah, I would like to think so. But uh, it was, but it was also, we were also under a lot of stress that I don't think we recognized at the time. Yeah, yeah. We all we all think that we're you know in those garage bands, you know that oh we got what it takes to be a band. Yeah, until you get out on the road. Yeah. What about those those days where you had to be your own roadie? What was that like? Well, yeah, early on, sure. <laughs> I mean, I had 
I have photos of Johnny Ramon putting his amp in the back of a car. Yeah. Uh, all that. We were always dragging gear around. Luckily, we lived close to CBGB, so it's just moving stuff back and forth. And people would people would share amps, and sometimes even drums would get shared. Yeah, you know. See, that's the part of the community that we don't see around even today. Even with with these these talent shows and things like that, when you ask them about, oh my God, you're writing with all of these people, but but what what about sharing musical instruments, sharing ideas, and and they they they're not they're not locked in on it like you were in your days. Yeah, you know, it's it's there it's things were a, little, a lot like the wild west back there compared to the way they are now. Yeah. There was no kind of live nation thing at the time. It, things are much smoother now. Do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and say, "Uh-uh, I, it's not over yet. I am not going to become a used to be. I am forever Chris Stein." Well, I, I you know, I try to stay current. Yeah. Uh I like doing the social media junk. Um, what you know, book is the book has been an interesting thing so far. I'm looking forward to people interacting with it. So I've become such a big Audible fan. Is it going to be available on Audible? And in the way, will we be able to have little snippets of songs so that people can identify? Because we know the music. Sometimes we just don't know the artist. Uh, yeah, there, there's no there's no songs in the audio book, and I didn't. I tried to read the audio book, but it's just too far out of my wheelhouse. I mean, doing a conversation like this is easy, yeah. but it takes a real skill to sit there and read this stuff successfully. I can so relate with you because I did one book. I was on page 35 with still 160 yeah. to go, and I was like, the hell, I can't do this. Yeah, no, I just I couldn't get going with it. It's too far out of my wheelhouse, as they say. So we got Dennis Boutsikaris, who's a great actor. Uh, film actor. He's in Better Call Saul, actually. And um, he was terrific, lovely guy. And that's what he does. He was one of his skill sets. Wow. Well, I can't congratulate you enough for this book, Under a Rock. And the reason why is because I was that jock on the air that had to rely on Billboard magazine or R&R magazine and all these newspapers and things to give me information to, to put over your song intros to help sell the music. I wish I would have had this book all those years ago. Thanks. Yeah, well, it was still going on at the time. Yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, I don't know what's going to happen next, but maybe 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 I'll get another book. I don't know. I love it. Please come back to this show anytime in the future, Chris. The door is always going to be open for you. Thanks, Arrow. You bet. You be brilliant today. Thank you.